everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, the latest installment in Historic Property Lectures. Um, I've many, I'm sure many of you have joined us for these lectures before. Um, they're very popular and ongoing with Montgomery County Alliance board member and local historian Kenny Schultz. Every third Thursday of the month, Kenny explores new topics of local history. We've covered everything from historic properties to maps and all kinds of other historic documents. Um, tonight, he'll be giving us a preview of historical discussions to come in 2022. So be sure to keep an eye on our website and register to join us in January and ongoing. Um, reminder, please remain muted during the presentation. You can send any questions you have throughout in the chat. And as always, there will be an opportunity at the end to unmute for a Q&A. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, make sure to check out our website and register to join us again soon. Without further ado, Kenny, take it away. All right. Thanks, Dottie. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And as always, just let me know if you can't see it. Let's see. Okay, so hopefully you all can see that. Um, it's good to be with you all again in December now. I can't believe we're in December. It feels like yesterday, it was March. Uh, I was looking back at this past year and um, looking at all the different topics that we've talked about together. And it looks like I managed to hit 10 out of 12 months, which is pretty good. Um, and we've talked about a whole lot of different issues related to, to local history here in the Ag Reserve. And I thought, you know, one, it's December. And so I'm just spending a lot of time thinking about this past year and on a number of different fronts and how fast it's gone by um, and what was accomplished and what was, you know, left to be done. Um, and then also thinking about the year ahead in 2022 and, and kind of um, where we go from here and the things that we can dive into in this case, um, as it relates to, to local history exploration. And so I thought what I would do tonight is talk a little bit about, you know, uh, highlight some of those things that we've addressed previously, and then lay out um, kind of my thoughts about what could be done next year. And I'm doing this for, for two reasons. One of which is, I've been with you all enough times now that I consider you more of my um, sounding board, almost a working group uh, to, to help kind of think through what, what you all want to see and what you think kind of the local community would want to see and participate in next year. And so I'm, as always, very interested in feedback and any kind of ideas that, that, that you guys have. Um, and two is it's a little bit of a, an accountability mechanism here. Um, I know that by coming on here and talking publicly about it and about what I want to um, ensure gets done for next year, I, I'm going to have this video on the internet that that's going to hold me a little bit accountable. So I'm, I'm doing it kind of intentionally and, and putting it out there for, for the audience to consume and, and hold me on next year. Um, and <clears throat> I, I want to be clear too that when I talk about some of these things that have been done and that I would like to see done in 2022, I, I don't want this, this is not meant to just be the, the Kenny show. Um, there are so many other people in our community doing really interesting, important, um, cool work around history. Um, Glenn Wallace comes to mind with all of his work with local cemeteries. Uh, John Walls is doing a ton of work with the CNO Canal and infrastructure there. Um, uh, Pastor Chuck doing all kinds of great work out in the, the Martinsburg um, historic black community, right? So there's a bunch of these individuals doing interesting things. And so when we talk about some of these things that, that can be done, um, I don't want to imply that I expect that I will necessarily lead them. I, of course, am happy to be involved with them and would like to see them come to fruition. But um, whoever, whoever wants to take charge on any of these things, I, I certainly uh, welcome because um, all of our, our schedules are busy, um, for sure. So I was looking back uh, yesterday at all of the, trying to pull up all the presentations that I've provided um, to this group over the last year. And these were the ones that I, I came across. And so as you can see, I mean, we've covered everything from slavery to suburban development 
to river crossings, talking about um, the battles of the Battle of Ball's Bluff and, and White's Ferry. Um, we've talked about historic homes out in Barnesville, Comus, and Dickerson. We've talked about historical structures around here that are architecturally kind of odd or, or significant. Um, and then we've spent a, a good amount of time um, talking about how do we do a better job of protecting historic infrastructure here in the Ag Reserve? What does it mean to protect um, historic infrastructure? And, and, you know, really, why does that even matter? You know, and so I would just say, again, really appreciate you all being here with me tonight, but I, I see essentially the same names month after month, which is awesome. And, I, and so I just want to say thank you for continuing to uh, be interested and be involved. And, and I really enjoy this forum and, and hopefully um, you all do too. So I, I feel like 2021 was, you know, kind of a, um, an odd year. I think coming out of 2020 with, with COVID, there was a little bit of an expectation that we would get back to normal on a bunch of things, namely kind of in-person talks and events and um, me being able to get inside more old homes and whatnot. And I think there was a, you know, there was a, a period of time there kind of towards the end of the summer, early fall, uh, where it did feel like we were there. Although I would say in the last week or two, especially here in Poolsville, I've unfortunately heard of just a very significant number of of COVID cases kind of upticking. And so I think at least for the moment, we are um, kind of moving back into a little bit of that defensive posture. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that as we get to 2022, um, that 2022 is going to be our year that we're going to be able to, to get out there and, um, and, and really kind of get our hands onto some of these, um, you know, historic properties and historic sites. Some of the some of the lessons as as it pertains to history that I think I'm pulling away and, and thinking about from this last year of just exploring and, and talking with you all and talking with other groups and doing tours. Um, this idea of fair access, uh, we you know we're talking a lot about that today, and we talk about it today in terms of how it relates to getting a. Um, you know, a new gym and, and new facilities at the high school. And of, of course, that's really important. Um, but I'm, I'm just kind of constantly reminded of this idea that fair access issues of, of equity are, are certainly not new in these parts. We, we talked kind of the last two sessions about um, the, the prevalence of slavery in these parts and, and what that means to have, you know, fair access to, to housing, to, um, to work, to uh, freedom. Um, and so this, this idea of, of fair access, I think, is always going to be a, a work in progress that is going to shift um, in, in focus, but, but always something that we will be um, kind of dealing with. Um, <clears throat> this idea of history repeating itself, very like cliche phrase, I, I'm seeing it in so many different ways these days. I think one of the more notable things is if you go to Monocacy Cemetery and you, you look at the dates of, of headstones, and I'll show you an example of this from a different cemetery in a minute, but if you look at the dates um, on, the, on the gravestones of when individuals died in the, in the 1800s, one of the things that you will commonly come across is husband and wife or sons, daughters, family members passing away within a couple of days of each other. And um, while the, the stones don't necessarily make note of the reason for that, in most cases, we can surmise that that is the result of um, sickness, um, of you know, um, issues with different diseases that were, that were prevalent in those times. And, and I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it makes me think about the idea of, of some of the ways that we feel today and, and, and even, even the knowledge that we have today as we're going about our daily lives. We're going up to CVS, we know to wear a mask or if we're going to work or whatever that means. Um, this issue of kind of dealing with this sickness is, is certainly not new. Um, but you can imagine, given how kind of scary things have been over the last year and a half, um, how much scarier it would be if you had really no idea of what it was that was taking place and no real knowledge of how to protect yourself. And you're just kind of out there on a whim. 
Um, and so, you know, we are going through something that is um, unique maybe in our lifetimes, but, but not really unique to the history of this place. Um, this idea of preservation. So we've had a couple of cases this year where we have lost historic uh, properties. Um, and I, I guess the, the two that I've been thinking about the most that are I think the most um, obvious ones are the chapel out there in Barnesville that came down a couple of months ago. And then out at, um, on, on Elgin, the, the Methodist church, the, uh, the little, um, uh, I guess house or it was that the, the the home for the for the pastor or the priest in years past um, that was recently um, taken down, and in both cases, I, I I actually place no real blame on any single individual or individuals. I I actually kind of place a larger blame on the community at large, um, because I think that they are good examples of structures where we drive past every single day. We see that they're in bad shape. We think for a couple of minutes about, wow, I wonder what's the plan there is and hopefully somebody does something about it. And we move on with our days, totally understandable. And then, you know, a year or two later, those structures are gone. Right. And, and, and in many cases, by the time we're noticing that they're in bad condition, they're, they're largely lost causes. And so um, there are other places throughout the Ag Reserve today that are in a condition where um, they're either already lost causes or they're, they're getting close to it. And it just kind of has me thinking about, you know, how do we how do we do a better job of identifying these and then trying to create some kind of, you know, maybe public conversation about, do we want to do something about this? Are, is it okay? Are we all okay with this structure being gone with it? You're not seeing it when you drive down this road each day. In some cases, maybe that's fine. Um, but, but hopefully we're, we can get to a place where we can at least kind of have that conversation in a way that is not, um, as it unfortunately normally plays out on Facebook, with people kind of insulting each other and, and calling each other out and, and kind of trying to keep the blame um, to a minimum. This, um, this land that we live on, Ag Reserve, is, is under, uh, I would say, constant threat from individuals who would like to come in and develop parts of it or do things on parts of the land that maybe um, are not um, in line with, with the vision um, as was set out when, when the Ag Reserve was created in, in 1980. And as I've mentioned before, you know, I don't, I don't think that the Ag Reserve in, in one day all of a sudden is gonna, someone's gonna come in and just develop the whole thing. I don't think it would happen like that. I think it would be this very, very slow degradation where you wouldn't even notice it until 50 years down the road and you look back and you're like, wow, we've really changed a lot. Um, and there might be situations or cases where we're, we're okay with a certain level of development or introduction of some kind of new infrastructure. Um, but I, but I do think another kind of example, kind of similar to the previous point of really being conscious of this slow, these slow changes that take place and really kind of considering the accumulation effects that take place over decades um, as a result of these actions. We, we talked about suburban development and um, uh, here in Poolswell and how Poolswell has changed over the years. And, you know, anytime you build a new neighborhood around town, you know, um, it's, it's certainly a way if you want to pack town hall, just propose a new development. Um, I, I think it's interesting, you know, I, I remember good friends of mine, I grew up here in Westerly and we had good friends um, when I was in eighth grade who moved to uh, the, the, Tama 2 neighborhood. And the, the reason that they cite it for doing that was this is definitely the last neighborhood that's coming to Poolsville. Like there's no, there's no more capacity, there's no more room. And, um, and of course, you know, that's not true. And I'm not suggesting that necessarily there's an unlimited cap, but I think that this idea of development and, and decisions and trade-offs and, and kind of what the community wants and doesn't want in a in a community here and what that looks like is always going to be something that's that's with us and, and worth considering. And then finally, and this is something that I've um, you know brought up a few times but continue to think about is is how our understanding of 
the past around these parts is shaped by um, kind of the economics and the people who yielded power um, in, in decades before us. And by that, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time talking about these predominant families from the 1800s because in many cases they had the means to build these really significant structures, um, which are still with us. And they provide this very tangible uh, ability to kind of look into the past. Um, but what's missing are a lot of the structures of um, the economically depressed from the past, right? And so we, we have kind of a less tangible link to those groups of people. And as a result, when we're studying local history, I think we end up spending a lot of time talking about um, wealthier families and kind of their experience. And I think it's worth considering, you know, whose experiences are being left out in this conversation. And I think we're doing a better job of bringing those into to the discussion. Um, but um, I think it's something we need to be conscious of. Um, and, and kind of similar, I think, and I brought this up last time, and I know Christine Ray brought this up previously, even prior to kind of the, the settlement of European <laughs> descent into this area, thinking about um, Native Americans and, and their experience here. I think that's a story that's largely gone untold to date. I don't know much about it, but I, I would love to see somebody dive into that work. Okay, so in 2022, I think my hope is that we, again, as a, a collective, can use local history and, and some of the things that we've already learned and some of these lessons um, to do a couple of things. One is educate younger members of our community about this community's past, um, good and bad. Lots of good things here, lots of other things, you know, lessons to be learned from not so good things. Um, but, you know, and, and I'm sure you all have noticed this too, when, when we do these talks, when we do um, historic tours, when Historic Medley District does an event or I am asked to go down county somewhere and talk to a group, I'm not talking to, you know, it, it's not high schoolers that are showing up, right? It's not, it's not um, individuals under the age of, of 30. Um, and, and that's, that's fine, um, but, I, but I would like to see a little bit of a stronger push to exposing some of, um, uh, of our younger populations uh, to some of this history. Because I, I think that um, A, it's of it's significant interest. B, I actually think that they would find it interesting if we just exposed it to them. Um, and so my hope is that we can kind of move into that, that direction next year. I think the, um, the tours that we've been able to do have shown and kind of proved to me that there is a, an ability to use local history and kind of historic tourism to drive some form of, of you know, small scale, small town economic development um, here in the Ag Reserve. And so I wanna press in on that a bit more. And then um, finally, there's, you know, there's a bunch of nonprofits operating um, throughout the Ag Reserve doing a lot of really important work. So I'm now, um, because I'm unable to say no to anything. I'm now on the boards for Montgomery Countryside Alliance, Historic Medley District, and the um, Monocacy Cemetery, which I, I love all three of these groups. So I'm very happy and proud to be part of all three. I'm also part of the American Legion here in town. And one of the things, I, I think there's actually a lot of commonalities across these groups. And um, I actually think that history is a major connector to, to all of these groups that, that can be utilized. It's, it's no, um, I, I don't think it should be any surprise that COVID and kind of the situation um, that we've dealt with over the last year and a half has not been friendly to small nonprofits in terms of financial um, security. Um, speaking just from, from HMD, you know, when you consider HMD owns the old town hall and um, the John Poole house and, and the Seneca schoolhouse, we have not been able to have people inside of those structures to do events or really drive, you know, revenue through, through the business. But at the same time, these are, these are old buildings that are falling apart. They don't, they don't much care about COVID um, or anything else. Right. And so there's still expenses each month that we are having to put into those structures to keep them 
standing and, and secured. Um, and so, you know, it's been, COVID has been hard. And so I'm, I'm hoping that um, A, in 2022, we can get more events into these places. Uh, but B, I really want to try to find a better job of some collaboration across these organizations to really um, secure kind of some of the, the financial well-being to, to make sure that they are around, you know, for, for generations to come. Because I think all of them do really, really important work. Okay, so some things that I am kind of excited about diving into and exploring next year and, and working with others to explore. So the, the first thing is um, uh, along the Potomac River and, and you know, John Walls can I, do a much better job providing the history on this, but we, we have this, um, this situation where throughout the early 1800s into the mid 1800s, you've got largely immigrant populations um, new to America playing a role in helping dig these canals. And as you can imagine, um, spending your days on, on the riverbanks of the Potomac digging canals is a pretty good place to pick up a bunch of the uh, diseases um, that, uh, that were you know, prevalent at, at, at that time. And as a result of that, we've got these canal workers frequently passing away as a result of, of disease. And I think it's a little bit of a sad tale um, because, you know, these are, these are immigrants in many cases new to the country or um, perhaps enslaved individuals. And the, the fact of the matter is that as a result, when, when these individuals died, they were largely kind of buried in these collective cemeteries kind of up and down the, the Potomac River. And um, I know for a fact here in the Ag Reserve, there's at least I think three, if not more, um, of these little long abandoned cemeteries um, kind of strewn throughout the, the woods, largely not cared for. Um, and I, I, I'm you know, interested in kind of digging into um, kind of the history of these cemeteries and the people that are buried there. Um, you can see this picture, I took this picture literally last weekend. And these are, these are just two gravestones that you come across right in the middle of the woods. Um, I mean, it's absolute middle of nowhere. And these, this was a, um, uh, a husband and wife died in 1847, um, a couple of days apart, 30 and 27 years old. I mean, clearly this is a result of some kind of either accident with an injury or more likely some kind of disease. Um, and so I think one of, one of the interesting things to maybe explore further as we, as we get into 2022 is, is this idea of um, uh, the canal workers, who they were, um, and, and thinking about where did they come from. Um, on their gravestones here, it actually mentions the county from Ireland that they came from. Um, and so it's, you know, it's just interesting to think about the stories of, of these people who are now kind of resting um, kind of off in the middle of nowhere in, in what was for them very, very strange land. And so I'd like to dig into that a bit more. So I've, I've talked about this cemetery before. Um, this is the, the Young Family Cemetery. This was, this was the cemetery that um, Glenn Wallace and, uh, and John Walls and, and I managed to kind of um, tracked down its location a couple of years ago. We found it and then the pictures that you see here were the result of a, a cleanup effort that we did back in, I wanna say January of 2020. Um, and so you can see the site is relatively, you know, it's relatively cleared out here, um, but now it's been the entire period of COVID since anybody has likely even been to the site. And so I can only imagine um, its current condition. And so I, I would like at some point, um, A, to get back out there and probably clean it up again, uh, and B, do a little bit of work with, with Glenn in the lead for sure of, of mapping this cemetery. Um, I'm not confident that we actually know everybody that was buried here. I think the more that we dug, we found more stone, not dug deep, but we, as we uncovered some dirt here and there, we were finding more and more stones. 
Um, and so I want to make sure that, you know, we, um, <laughs> we have everybody accounted for uh, in this, in this spot. And so that's, that's something else um, on the cemetery uh, angle that I, that I want to dig in on. And then, you know, I mentioned last week or, or the last time we talked about um, these, these two congregations of churches in town with the Methodist church and um, Pastor Chuck's um, congregation coming together. Um, and they've been meeting, you know, since last year, largely kind of coming out of, of the ongoing discussions across the country on um, issues of, of equity within, with regards to race. And they've, they've been working together on a couple of different projects. One of the things that I've actually wanted to do since before COVID, and, and this is something that I know that this group is interested in participating in, is the Martinsburg Cemetery, which is kind of located, if you know where Kaleba Farm is, this is, this is kind of bordering it up, up really set back off a, a, a gravel road, but there's the historic Martinsburg Cemetery. Um, it's believed that at least some of the individuals buried in the cemetery lived parts of their lives enslaved. Uh, and the, the picture that you see here is kind of the, the part of the cemetery that's been cleared out, but stretching back um, into the woods behind this spot, if you dig into the brush, you will continually find stones that are cl clearly markers. And so we believe this is actually a quite large cemetery. Um, it's going to take a lot of work to clear it out because the brush back here is quite thick. Um, but I know that there's a lot of interest in this. And so my hope is that, um, you know, maybe this winter, depending on what COVID looks like, we can pull a group together to get out there and, um, and clear it out, but then also um, catalog it similar to, to the Young Family uh, Cemetery. So the Boatler Farm, I've been, um, I've been, bugging my buddy Jim Poole on this one um, for, for more details. Uh, this farm is interesting to me because it is located close to the Potomac River um, in a location where I would think Union troops would have marched right through the yard on the way to fight the Battle of Ball's Bluff. It's, um, it's a home, I've never actually seen it in person because it sits that far back off the road in the woods. Uh, this is one of the few homes, I can't even, I can't even figure out exactly who owns it. Um, so that, that's been a challenge that I don't normally come across. Uh, but I, I am fascinated by it, I think simply because it's, it's one of the few houses that I've yet to really even get close to. Um, and so my hope is that I can dig into this one a little bit I'd like to know and figure out when exactly it was built. I'm, uh, there's not really any good reason for this, but I'm just kind of personally curious about whether or not it was actually here for the Civil War. It, was, it, it would have been built around that time, just given kind of the architectural features. Um, but, but yeah, I'd like to see it. I'd like to go inside of it. And, um, and, and I'd like to explore this place a little bit further because there's really not much in, in the historic records. And, I think that's kind of one of the interesting things about this area is if you if you go into kind of the Maryland holdings um, on the historic write-ups of, of some of these places, some of these homes have just these incredible write-ups that are page after page of, of, you know, descriptive language and tons of pictures and, you know, a whole chain of ownership. And, it, it, you know, you really feel like you understand the, the home and what's taken place there over the past. And then other homes show up in the files, but they, they have almost nothing, maybe a single picture and maybe a note on who owned it, you know, at some point when it was initially built or something, but there's not much. And this is kind of one of those houses um, beyond this picture and uh, some small reference to, to the family name that owned it. There's just, there's not much detail here. And so this is just one of a couple of houses where I'd like to know more. And I suspect that maybe some of the answers are at this home or at least with whoever is is in ownership of this home and so i'd like to talk with them so um this is an example of a home that does have <laughs> extensive write-ups and um plenty of you know interesting historic anecdotes this is the nathan dickerson pool house we talked about this um this past year in, when i was talking about some of the um the homes that are 
architecturally kind of odd for this place. And, you know, as you can see from the picture and, and the description there, kind of sometimes referred to as gingerbread Gothic, which I, I love. I think it's a pretty apt description for this home. Um, built in 1870 by the Poole family. Um, I have a good sense of, you know, who has owned it over the years and some of the events that have taken place here. Uh, but I, I really, really want to see what the interior of this home looks like. And so my hope is, um, A, I can uh, maybe wear down the property owner and B, um, you know, once, once we get past COVID a little bit and people are a bit more um, comfortable with having a stranger come into their home, um, that will be an opportunity available so that I can share it with all of you. Um, so we'll, we'll see if this one can kind of be further explored. The Trundle Farm is, a lot of people recognize this, um, this home. Um, this picture was taken by um, uh, Mrs. Pitts. She posts all the time on the, on the Facebook page. She takes really awesome pictures. Um, and this, this farm, it's, I know it as the Trundle Farm. I've heard others call it Huntview and others call it, it I think the sign out front now says it's Palmer Vale Farm, um, built in the 1870s. This is kind of down off of River Road. You can also see it from Hughes Road. It's got, this is another example of kind of a, an architecturally odd looking house. I don't know of too many others that look quite like this in the Ag Reserve. Um, I'd like to obviously see the house, but also, you know, we spent, I spent a lot of time the last two years thinking and, and digging into the White and Chiswell families because they were, you know, pretty predominant in these parts, very wealthy, built a lot of structures, um, wrote a lot of letters that we can look at. The Trundles are another family though that were very well to do in these parts. Um, they're the ones that initially built Annington, the, the large home down by um, White's Ferry. Uh, Otho Trundle also built another home out um, towards Dickerson, which is you know still with us and a really unique and interesting home. Um, and so I'd like to spend a little bit of time digging further into not only this house, but also kind of the, the Trundle family and that's that um, kind of line of, of individuals in these parts um, to kind of learn more and see where those connections are. Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge is um, a property out in Dickerson. It is um, uh, an absolutely beautiful home, very kind of classic in its like kind of Georgian style. Um, I suspect built in 1840s maybe would be my guess. I don't know that for sure. This is a good example of a home where when we go into the records, um, there's a lot of pictures, which is cool because it's a beautiful home, but not a lot of detail on the actual history of the place. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in learning more. I have a little bit of a um, a lead on on the owners here that I'm kind of working on slowly. Um, so hopefully we'll we'll see what develops here. But um, but this is another property that um, I, I think would be awesome to get into um, and and see the interior. And then and we've talked about this previously, but I really think um, the the Rosenwald School out here in in Poolsville. Um, which is that structure you see there? It's at the. It's actually at the beauty spot. Um, it, it's it's such a, I think, significant piece of you know historic uh, of the the story of kind of our historic black communities around these parts, and honestly, I think it's um, it's a real shame that it's passed by. I don't I don't think most people know that that that's what this is. That's how that's, this structure came to be. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, the fact that the county owns it in addition, I, I would actually like to see and, and even push a little bit more um, public discussion on this, even, you know, down county with even members of, of county councils, just to make sure that um, they recognize and, and understand what they have here, because I'm not sure that they do. Um, and then make sure that, you know, there's some plan in place to, if nothing else, ensure that it, it, it remains intact and, and its integrity, at least in its current state, um, stays, stays steady. Because there, you know, there are, 
some Rosenwald schools left across Montgomery County, but there aren't a bunch of them. Um, and they were all built in the 1920s. And so, you know, they're nearing 100 years old now. And so I want to make sure that this one is, is with us, but, but also that it's, um, it's known, that people understand what it is that they're looking at, that it's not just some building that's part of this, you know, beauty spot depot, that it was here long before that, and it had a different purpose when it was initially built. So these three homes, um, East Oaks, Annington, and Inverness, I, I, I know that I talk about them pretty much every time. They're kind of my three uh, dream homes here in the Ag Reserve that I kind of think of them in you know, almost like a trifecta. Um, the, the commonality running between them is when you dig into the history, an individual by the name of Charles Wilson seems to have um, his, his hands on design. I mean, in, in, the, in the history books, it says that Charles Wilson built these homes. We know that he did not build, the, build these homes physically. We know it was without question enslaved labor that built these homes, but he certainly would, would have been, I guess, what we would consider today to be kind of a, maybe the architect and almost project manager of, of getting these homes, um, you know, upright. And we don't have a lot of information on him. Um, there are members of the Wilson family buried out at Monocacy. He might be there. I'm not completely sure. Um, but I would like to, he's been a, he's been an individual that I've been trying to learn more about to understand um, kind of where he came from, where that wealth came from. Um, that double L in Wilson is intentional. That's apparent. When I look at the, the history records, that's how it's spelled every time. So that's at least a little helpful just because the name Charles Wilson with one L would be very hard to um, distinguish because it'd be such a common name. Um, so anyway, so I, I'm curious about digging in on him and learning more about um, how he got to these parts and kind of his role in constructing these homes and whether or not he had a role in, in building some of the other places in these parts. Um, you know, significantly, I think maybe it's possible he was involved in Aix La Chapelle um, out on Jerusalem Road, which was owned by the Brewer family. Um, so anyway, so just another, another piece of, of, of the puzzle to, to learn more about. We talked a lot this year um, about, oh, I've got a question about um, the Rosenwald School. Um, so, so Rosenwald was a, um, a wealthy Jewish businessman in um, the early 1900s here in America. And he, you know, at recognizing kind of the, the persecution that he had seen um, Jewish people face, he, he kind of noted publicly, you know, feeling a certain sentiment towards the way that um, our African American populations were being, you know, treated um, here in America. And he partnered with, um, I want to say Booker T. Washington, don't hold me on that, but I want to say he partnered with him. They built a couple of schools in the Deep South um, using kind of a very, um, very generic and straightforward design plan intended to provide better school conditions for African American children. Um, as we talked about last time, you know, after the Civil War, the, the, the buildings that, you know, um, Black children were learning in were just completely, you know, subpar. Um, and so his idea was to build these schools that would, that would provide a better environment because that would, um, you know, allow uh, just, just better conditions to learn. And as a result, this, this idea really kind of caught fire a little bit and spread up the East Coast. Um, and so as a result, there's a couple of, of buildings here in Montgomery County that were built as Rosenwald schools in the 1920s. When we got to the 1940s, 50s, um, those structures started to be outdated and we started to move into more permanent brick structures. Um, Taylor Elementary is a really good example out in Boyd's of kind of where a lot of students left the Rosenwald school and went, went there. Um, but as a result, we have the legacy of these, these school buildings, which you know, across the county have been converted to other conditions. In some cases, they are homes, they're office buildings. In our case here in Poolsville, they, you know, it's out at the, that county depot, what we call the beauty spot. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, they're, they're kind of referred to as, as Rosenwald schools. Um, so kind of a, an interesting you know, story to, to the past and, and to that building. Um, 
And I, I see a bunch of other questions here. Now I will jump on all of these once we get to the end of this. So no worries. Um, enslaved quarters. So I've talked a lot about these. I, I think that there's there's a lot more work to be done here. Um, when I talked about these structures with um, Pastor Chuck's congregation um, about a month ago, one of the things that I just kind of noticed was that a lot of the um, the black men in, in the the audience were. I don't want to say surprise, but they, they weren't aware that so many of these structures still existed and were intact. And there was a clear interest in, in seeing them. Um, and I can totally envision and love to see some kind of thing where we, you know, expose different individuals to these structures. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty, it's one thing to look at these pictures, but it's a pretty powerful feeling to walk inside of these structures. Um, and I think that's an important thing for, for us to do. So, you know, with this exploration comes kind of the imperative to, to share and, and tell the stories of these places. Um, I, you know, for, for me personally, when I think about sharing it, I'm thinking about obviously continuing these talks. Um, one, I, I, I love these talks, but also it's a really great forcing function for me to do some research each month and, and pull something together. And, and so it kind of forces me to be accountable with myself. Um, you know, continuing to push in the monocle. Uh, I, I feel like the monocle is quickly becoming basically just a um, historical focused newspaper with a couple of current uh, current news items. I feel like between me and John Walls and Randy and, um, you know, uh, a couple and uh, Jack Toomey and, and others, a lot of the stories are kind of local history things, um, which, you know, is, is great. Um, I have a website. I really want to update it. That's been something I've been thinking about. Social media continues to be a really great place, um, especially in times of COVID to reach out. And then just when and if possible in-person talks and, and especially I would really like to get into local high schools um, to talk about some of this stuff because I think it's I think it's important and I think that's probably the right age for some of these students to be hearing about some of these issues that we've been talking about. I want to do more tours. I, I love the tours um, and it seems like everybody else does too. And to be frank, I don't feel like they're all that hard to, to pull off anymore, um, depending on kind of the format in which we do them. So I've been thinking about different ways that we can do this. Um, I think everybody loves going inside the homes and, and I of course want that to be part of it, but I think there's a lot of interest in barns. I think um, working with Glenn, we could certainly come up with some really interesting things um, out at Monocacy, but also even just at some of these, you know, I showed you the picture of that, that cemetery out in the middle of the woods. I think people would be fascinated and curious to kind of look at places like that. Um, so figuring out ways to do that. Um, I think the rustic roads here, if you look at the map of the county's rustic roads, it's basically just this part of the ag reserve. Um, and so even, even the roads here are old and have historic stories. And so if there's a way of kind of exposing those stories, um, I think that could be interesting. And then as I, as I mentioned, I think something around um, slavery and the enslaved quarters and just and, and our black communities um, is, is certainly worthwhile um, for groups to, to, to lean in on. Okay. So that's, I mean, I was afraid I would only have like 10 minutes of stuff to talk about, but clearly that's not the case. Um, so if anybody has questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Um, okay. So Jack asked what my website is. So I'm going to type it into the chat now. That's the site. Um, somebody asked about the brick home in the Tama development. And I know, I know exactly what home you're talking about. That's another one. I didn't make a slide for it. It's another one on my list. Um, I, I, so I don't know a ton about it. Um, I think it's, I think it's tied to the pool family. Um, but it's, you know, it's like, I feel like I've been inside so many old homes now. And every time I think like, I think I've seen them all. I look at the map and remember that there, there are so many around here um, that are still just open for exploration. So I don't know a ton about that one, but I, I would like to certainly know more. Um, and so if anybody in Tama happens to know the owners, please make some introductions for me. Um, let's see. Yeah, someone asked about historic barns. 
uh, there's, there's so many cool old barns here. I'm not personally really a barn person. Um, I'm, I'm more into the homes, but it's really, really clear to me that people love um, seeing them. And I think, you know, I've been talking recently with people about some kind of historic barn tour, which would be incredibly easy to do because, you know, you're not asking homeowners to go inside their houses. And um, so I, I think it's, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty easy thing to set up. Uh, and so that's certainly something that we, we will look at doing. Glenn and I were talking the other day about maybe some kind of barn tour where the final stop is some kind of, you know, events or just happy hour or whatever um, at the last barn, just for people to kind of hang out and maybe raise some money for some of these nonprofits or something. So um, we'll see. Um, let's see here. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Jack wants me to do um, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda is an absolute genius um and um yeah he's that's 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 a hard act to follow um let's see I don't know about the Fairbanks home upstream from Broad Run hmm. I'm sure I don't I don't know which home that is um uh, yeah, and then the Jones Sims Hall House. Um, so I, I could be wrong about that, but I think it was built by um, the, the Jones family who started uh, Jonesville. Um, I think that was the or one of the original homes. Um, I think the interesting thing about Jonesville, we talked about this a little bit last time, is this idea that it's believed that Jonesville was actually started by enslaved persons um, from Aix-la-Chapelle, which is the large white home kind of across the street, who were, were fleeing that property because um, on, the, on the land that is now Jonesville was a union um, encampment site. And so they were offering you know, protection. And so we had individuals coming to that location um, and then the war ends and you know the army leaves and, and now we have this this space to, to set up this community so um, I think that's a really interesting story I don't know I'd like to see the evidence on it but I, I think it um, I think it makes a lot of sense anybody else feel free to unmute or put any more questions you have in the chat Uh, yeah, sign for Owensville. Um, I so I I don't know this for sure, but I, I believe Owensville was kind of a, a small um, uh, black community uh, in the area. There's there's actually so when we talk about our kind of historic black communities um, around Poolsville. You know, the ones that come up a lot are Jerusalem and Jonesville and Sugar Land and Martinsburg. And um, those are, you know, certainly kind of the, the larger ones. But there were actually pockets of even kind of smaller, I wouldn't even say that they're necessarily communities, but kind of clusters of, of homes that took on names. There's even, so I, I think that that's what Owensville was. Um, but there's even, a, there's even a spot out on kind of um, close to Peachtree there was a community that I've seen on maps that was called Texas, which is odd in these parts, but I, I think it was kind of a similar thing where we had a couple of structures um, kind of clustered together and kind of got their own, their own name um, for, you know, who knows how that name was ascribed to it. Um, Do we have any last questions? No, but all I can say, Kenny, is you have been so fabulous over these 20 months that we've gone virtual with programming and everything that you brought up for the year to come. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't wait to hear that. I can't wait to hear about that. Nope. And, you know, hopefully we can do some outside. Tours. Yeah. Like the barns are going to be more open. So maybe right. we won't be as restrictive. So. Yeah. And working on the cemeteries, the same thing. So all very interesting. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed that 2022 is our, our year. <laughs> Let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> I already know with how popular the pop-up walks are and historic property lectures are, you put those together with visiting some of those in-person places, I think people would absolutely love it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's one thing to do this and I love doing this, but it is, yeah. it is something else to be able to kind of see these structures up close. Absolutely. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation as much as I did and learned something new and are looking forward to joining us next year in 2022. If you think of any questions, as always, you can email us later at info at poolsvilleseniors.org. If you'd like to unmute or turn on your camera to say goodbye, now's the time. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please leave a like and a comment. We'd like to thank Kenny for not only this presentation, but all of his presentations over this year. Um, really, Historic Property Lectures has become such a fixture of our Thursday night presentations, and we always look forward to them. Um, we'd also like to thank our ongoing sponsors and private contributors that help us keep our programs going because we love putting them on for you. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events. We'll be back January 6th with Sugarloaf Mountain History. We hope you all enjoy your holidays. Um, as always, you can find all of the upcoming info at poolsvilleseniors.org. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, everyone. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs> <laughs>